Oh, hello, I'm Victor Strandberg, and I'm back for another session in the poetry of T.S. Eliot. But first, I need to correct a misstatement from my last session on Portrait of a Lady, in which I said that the letters, hundreds, perhaps over a thousand letters from T.S. Eliot to his friend Emily Hale, uh, would be opened in 1919. Of course, I meant to say 2019, seven years from now, when the public will finally have a better idea about the relationship between these two people, which might lie behind the poem, Portrait of a Lady. Now today we're going to take up a short poem called Preludes. T.S. Eliot seemed to love musical notation in his titles, the love song of, T of J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, Rhapsody on a Windy Night, that's a musical composition, four quartets, uh, in this case, preludes. We've seen the reference to preludes in Portrait of a Lady. Uh, the lady and the gentleman have been, let us say, to hear the latest poll transmit the preludes through his hair and fingertips, so intimate this Chopin, etc. Up until this time, T.S. Eliot's poetry has followed William Butler Yeats's dictum that poetry is a quarrel with itself in terms of romance versus realism. Romance being loosely defined as a yearning for a better life versus a reality that denies any such possibility. And we could say that in addition to the love song of J. Alfred okay. Prufrock oh, in, in, uh, and Portrait of a Lady and Sweeney Among the Nightingales, uh, we could add a number, a considerable number of Eliot's early poems including Burbank with a Bidecker, Bleistein with a cigar. Uh, Burbank would be a wasp type of name, upper class like the Eliots. Uh, and uh, he's carrying a Bidecker. This would be a romantic element in the sense that the Bidecker is a tour guide of the cultural high achievement of Europe, palaces, cathedrals, great libraries, estates, uh, the wonderful architecture of the high civilization of Europe. By, uh, Burbank would be on a, such a grand tour. Um, the other half of the title, Bleistein with a cigar, obviously this is a Jewish businessman. His business, not surprisingly, is running a brothel. And uh, Burbank is detoured from his high calling of ingesting the cultural feast of Europe into Bleistein's place of business. Romance versus realism. Sweeney erect, a title, of course, that has a double meaning, uh, needs no further explanation, I think, in light of what we've already seen about Sweeney. Uh, other titles, A Cooking Egg, The Hippopotamus, Whispers of Immortality, Mr. Eliot's Sunday morning service, and a number of other poems would fall under this category of romance versus realism. In the poem for today, a very short poem called Preludes, as we've mentioned, something momentous happens, profoundly significant for the future direction of Eliot's poetry, that transposes the terms of this conflict. We continue with poetry as a conflict within oneself, a quarrel with oneself, as Yeats put it, the heart in conflict with itself, as Faulkner put it. But now the terms will not be romance versus realism. It'll be something far more significant for T.S. Eliot, namely the conflict between his naturalistic intellect and a surprising and unexpected upsurge of religious desire. 
We begin Preludes in part one uh, with a description of a perfectly naturalistic cityscape. Eliot claimed in his later life that from Baudelaire in Flowers of Evil, a work published around 1850, Baudelaire did something new in poetry. He showed us the grubbiness, the depraved side of a modern city uh, as a stock of images uh, that would be suitable for modern poetry. And indeed, uh, instead of celebrating the high achievement of the modern city, Anne Rand, for example, said that the New York skyline, skyline is the will of man made visible, a memorable line. Uh, but instead, for Eliot as for Baudelaire, the city is a, a, a backdrop for the depravities of humankind, uh, for their diminished state, for the lack of any potential of spiritual achievement. So we begin then uh, with the winter evening settling down and with an assault on the five senses that you'll find in the big city. The smell of steaks in passageways, the burnt out end of smoky days, uh, as usual, the uh, air in the city leaves something to be desired, especially then uh, with no environmental protections. And now a gusty shower wraps the grimy scraps of withered leaves about your feet, newspapers from vacant lots. Uh, we end uh, this part one as the evening moves on with the lighting of the lamps. We begin part two in the morning. So this poem represents the day in the life of a naturalistic sensibility. Are giving us the limited possibilities in the naturalistic backdrop of a modern city. The morning then comes to consciousness with another assault on the senses, the faint, stale smell of beer, sawdust trampled streets, muddy feet that press to early coffee stands. And as part two ends, we have, I think, a note of sympathy entering the picture. One thinks of all the hands that are raising dingy shades in a thousand furnished rooms. The dingy shades, the furnished rooms, suggest to me that for once T.S. Eliot is viewing sympathetically the life of the working class. In part three, the speaker wonders if it's worth even getting up in the morning. You tossed a blanket from the bed. You lay upon your back and waited. You dozed and watched the night revealing the thousand sordid images of which your soul was constituted. Apparently, this speaker, this subject, uh, is an insomniac. And we have a number of insomniacs in Eliot's poetry. I think Gironchin would be one, a little further down the line in our lectures, uh, who lie awake, tormented by this naturalistic view of life. The same sort of thing you had in Hemingway, his insomniacs uh, in a clean, well-lighted place, for example, lie awake thinking of nada, our nothing, um, uh, who was who, uh, hail nothing, full of nothing, is the way he puts it, to begin with, nothing be thy name, and so forth, as he uh, handles the Lord's Prayer and, uh, of course, the rosary in that short story, speaking of Hemingway. Something similar here. And um, as we proceed in part three of Preludes, we end up with what seems to be a female subject. Sitting along the bed's edge, you curled the papers from your hair or clasped the yellow soles of feet in the palms of both soiled hands. <laughs> 
of course they'd be soiled. Of course there would be yellow soles of feet. Uh, nothing romantic about this portrait of life in Eliot's youth in the big city. Now part four of this brief poem is where something momentous happens to rise against this perspective we have been looking at. And part four begins with what might be interpreted, at least later in Eliot's poetry, as a cruciform position. His soul stretched tight across the skies. Uh, and then we go on with what looks like the usual naturalistic description of life in this time. Um, insistent feet at four and five and six o'clock. We're getting back to the evening again. A life, excuse me, a day in the life of, let us say, J. Alfred Prufrock after uh, he has failed to break out of his loneliness and has this meaningless, wasted life. Feet at four and five and six o'clock, trampling the streets, and short square fingers stuffing pipes, and evening newspapers. You remember the young man reading a newspaper as a narcotic in Portrait of a Lady. A Greek um, was murdered at a Polish dance. A co English countess goes upon the stage as though, as though those were the only meaningful things we can get out of a common existence. Against all that, we have something extraordinary that rises up to do battle against it, a very powerful religious hunger. Uh, beginning with the conscience of a blackened street, I am moved by fancies that are curled around these images and cling, the notion of some infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering thing. Now, a dozen years later, perhaps a little less than that, uh, T.S. Eliot was converted to the Christian faith. I had become an Anglo-Catholic, he said, and a very devout, even militant Christian after that point. This, I think, is the first foreshadowing of that development. When he wrote this poem, he did not realize what would come of this image, but it really is, I think, uh, one way to say uh, that um, something in Eliot is rising up vigorously uh, to carry on the quarrel with himself, in this case, against his naturalistic intellect. And that's something infinitely gentle, infinitely suffering, would turn out to be Christ some years hence. He could not know that at this time. Now, it's typical that at this point in Eliot's development, his spiritual development, we could say, that in the quarrel between religious hunger and his naturalistic intellect, the intellect, of course, wins the battle. In fact, this moment of religious desire is embarrassing. For that reason, the poem ends with a return to naturalistic reality. The worlds revolve like ancient women, gathering fuel in vacant lots, vacant lots indeed, spiritually. And for that reason, uh, we have an order that he gives himself, wipe your hand across your mouth and laugh. Laugh at his own religious desire, uh, which he now dismisses contemptuously. Uh, but that religious hunger would return again and again. We'll see it coming on prominently in the wasteland and in the hollow men. And eventually that voice would win out over the naturalistic intellect. Uh, this opening shot in that battle is what makes this poem prelude so significant and so unexpected among these early poems of T.S. Eliot. We'll proceed next with his poem, Girondin, uh, which we might say would represent a sort of entrance to the wasteland. <clears throat>